So Python 3.10 finally launched a few days ago. I've been waiting for it for a long time. I'm sure many people have as well, at least the stable release anyway. Of course, with all the new features and everything, the, uh, the pattern matching uh, specifically was a really big talking point uh, for a lot of the time that 3.10 was being developed. But now that everything is out and it's all stable and, and everything is kind of there, if that makes sense. Uh, and I'm just doing a video now to kind of go over everything that's new, everything that's changed, or at least all the major things. I mean, obviously there's a lot of stuff that's changed. I'm not gonna go every, through every single thing, but kind of the more important features, the more widely used things and all that, just to get people up to speed. You know, maybe people haven't seen the 3.10, what's new thing, or they just haven't really been keeping up and waiting for Stable to come out. Well, here it is, you can download it now. <laughs> yeah, this is just gonna be a video pretty much covering all the bases of everything major that's new in Python 3.10. Of course, if you find the video helpful at any point, then consider liking to let me know and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos like this. Yeah, with that out of the way, let's get straight into it. So I'm gonna be covering all of these things in the order in which they're presented in the what's new in Python 3.10 page, but we are starting with the biggest change of them all, which is pattern matching. It's essentially Python's answer to switch statements. It uses, um, I, I think, I think pattern matching and switch statements do work slightly differently under the hood. Uh, I don't know for sure, but this is just kind of how Python decided to implement it. So this has been kind of on people's minds for a little while, but um, it just hadn't really been implemented because they didn't know how to do it, but obviously they worked it out. And so we're gonna be talking about it now. So I'm actually gonna be showing you inside an IPYNB file because it's just easier for me to kind of demonstrate the differences between the two. So if we say have, you know, uh, a little bit of an input that says is pattern whoops matching cool uh, and then we take that input we run the cell and then we just say yes for example we have that answer stored okay so we create a new cell and this is how you would do it previously so say if you wanted to have like a yes or no answering system you would do something like this so if answer dot lower uh, uh, dot lower sorry to catch you know all different cases you would have, if it is in yes or why, so you can have a why or a yes. You could pr print, I know you chose yes. Uh, sorry, we have an elif, so you'd have to do this answer or lower again. If you're on Python 3.8 or higher, you could use the walrus operator here, but no one likes it, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, because genuinely no one that watches my videos understands what that does. I've had so many questions about it whenever I've used it, and I've, I've made a vow never to use uh, the walrus operator but anyway if we're if it matches no or n we can do that otherwise we print you know that isn't valid my computer is freaking out right now i do apologize for that so if you run the cell now let's say we chose yes uh, if we run them all again and we choose no this time we can say we chose no if we run them all again and we just put in something random then it says that isn't valid you can see that down here so that works great however python match statements are a lot nicer um, at doing that. So you start with match answer lot lower. And currently, because it's really new, the match statement isn't uh, highlighted a different color in notebooks. It is in scripts, which is weird, but Pylance still has a bit of a problem with it. Uh, so just kind of know that it does work. It just might not look as though it's going to. Um, and then you have your colon here, and then inside here you put some cases. So say case yes, and the or operator is this. Um, so this is saying it's taken answer dot lower, so it only ever has to do that once now. And it's saying if answer dot uh, lower is yes or why, uh, then print. Uh, you just you chose yes. We'll just have the same prints just to make it easier. Case uh, no or n prints you chose no uh, and then otherwise so case wildcard and this is what this underscore does so this is basically a catch all so this sort of works like the else so if it is anything else any other case we do print that isn't valid i don't actually remember what the equivalent of that in c is i think it might just be an else but i don't know but either way you know, we have our answer for before, which is test. So we say that isn't valid. But if you run this again, say yes, uh, they both so say, sorry, you chose yes. If you put no, both say, it. if we had um, just Y, you chose yes, just no, chose no. Q, for example, that isn't valid, but of course you could have anything else. 
in there that you wanted to. If you're curious to learn more about it, then I'd, uh, I'd actually recommend going and looking at PEP 636, which is what the structural pattern matching is. This is the tutorial. So 634 is the specification, 635 is something else, I don't remember. But 636 is the tutorial. And this actually takes you through kind of all the different ways that you can use this. And it also goes over like a lot of crazy ways that you could do it. So you can have, um, you know, especially if you're working with lists or something, that you can do some mad stuff. Uh, this kind of text adventure game is actually probably the best example you can look at it um, for. But it, it's a very complicated example, which is why I didn't do it in this video. So you could do crazy stuff like this as well and crazy stuff like this is so you can have it as keyword it's just mad it's just absolutely crazy um so yeah i'd recommend if you want to learn more about it going and looking at this pep 636 specifically okay so the next thing i want to talk about is kind of quite a small syntactic change and it is parenthesized context managers so in the past you could only really do something like this. So say if you wanted to, you know, open a file, you'd use with open, you'd have that as F1, for example. If you wanted to open a second file, you would have to do with open uh, goodbye.txt. It's actually, this is slightly in the wrong place because it's data slash. I put it all in a slightly different place so it was less confusing to people as F2. And then you'd have to do print F1.read, uh, whoops, and then print F2.read. And if you loaded that, uh, so, it's just me installing stuff to actually get the IPython kernels to work. Uh, <laughs> PythonContext.py, you'd have hello, hello world and goodbye world. And you'd have to do it like that. However, in Python 3.10, you can do it with a single with statement. So you can now do it like uh, this. And this should, if I do that and that, there we go. Oops. And this will work the same way. So you now can unindent that one more. And it does exactly the same thing. So it just means that you can use more than one context manager in a single with statement. I think there was a way you could do that before, but it wasn't particularly clean if there even was a way. Um, so this is just a far nicer way of doing that. So the third thing I want to talk about is in addition to the zip function that quite a few people use to kind of lazily unpack data because it is quite useful for that. So say if we had some data here, and you had uh, an, a nested list. So one, two, three, and then uh, one, whoops, two, three. And you wanted to unpack this. Well, normally you would do something like uh, list, zip, and then asterisk data. Like that when I get rid of the extra brackets. And if we run all of those, uh, using this kernel, please. <clears throat> Uh, you'll see that it's now kind of, it's put it as, actually, I think you could probably have a, a dict and it does it. There we go. That's probably a bit clearer. So it now converts our nested lists into, you know, one, one, two, two, three, three. It does all that just fine. However, if you were to have, I'll just move this down here. So say if you were to have, you know, one that was four in length and another that was three in length, then what would happen... <clears throat> Uh, and you can still do this in 3.10 the same way. What would happen is that you'd end up just losing this four entirely. Uh, this four wouldn't be, um, you know, used at all. And in some situations, that is the preferred effect. So you would just leave it as, as it is. But in the vast, vast majority of situations, these two lists really do need to be the same size. And that is why you can now pass the strict argument in. So you can say strict equals true. And what this does is it throws a value error if um, <clears throat> the, um, oh, sorry, if one of these lists is shorter than the other. So in this case, argument two is shorter than argument one. It actually tells you which one is shorter and it so won't let you do it. So if you pass this strict equals true, you can make sure that no data is being lost, especially if you have huge, huge amounts of data and you don't want to lose any of it. This strict equals true is just really useful for that. So you can then, you know, implant uh, extra dummy data to kind of uh, pad out uh, whichever one was shorter and then you work it out that way. So I alluded to this one in my type hints video and I actually talked about it 
in there. It's the How to Python video. There'll be a card in the top corner if you want to know more about that. You know, seeing as we're talking about everything new in Python 3.10, it would be weird for me to leave this out because I'd already talked about it. But I've got a different, slightly better example um, to actually show it off. So you can do something like add numbers, or you know, just add, which just adds you know two numbers together. So return x and y. What you would have to do before is do import typing uh, and then you'd have so where x is typing dot union uh, and this can be an int or a float in our hypothetical function you would have a y which is the same so you'd have int or float and this would return a typing dot union you can kind of see the problem here so, so there were ways around it before so you could set like a type um, kind of parameter. So I think you could do something like t equals that and then have x equals t, y equals t, and whatever. But there is now an easier way of doing it. <clears throat> so what you can do now is instead of doing all this typing.union stuff, you can do int or float. And that is so much cleaner and easier to read. So this or operator is, is back again. And we're saying this is now an int or a float, the y is int or a float, and then we return it out as either an int or a float. This behavior is available from Python 3.7 if you import annotations from future, um, but it is now standard in Python 3.10. The final thing that I want to talk about is improved errors in Python 3.10. So while error tracebacks are quite nice to look at, you know, they are certainly a lot nicer than something like C, they give you a, a good amount of information. The actual final line, kind of the cause, can sometimes be incorrect. So for example, and you can see that I've actually brought up 3.9 for this, so you can see how it was before. If we had some errors like this, and I should disclaim uh, that a lot of these errors are brought over directly from the Python document, because they just you know seem like the best errors to do. Um, and you have some other code equals foo foot like that and you try to run that um it would say you know there's an invalid syntax error at the equals sign which isn't really the cause of the issue however in python 3.10 when we do the same thing again we actually get a different error so it actually tells us that on line one our set was never closed. So we can do this again and it should, in theory, say that's fine now. Well, I say, yeah, name foo is not defined. But it can now detect that the error, uh, that the syntax error previously was because that this uh, brace here was never closed when it should have been. So there are other things that it can do as well. So if we bring this one over, for example, this is um, an error saying that the generator expression here should be... Um, <clears throat> you know, parenthesized. And now in Python 3.10, it actually shows you exactly what it's talking about. In 3.9, it did have a uh, generate expression must be parenthesized, but it now has these arrows pointing to exactly what is the cause of the issue. And another big one for a lot of people is indentation errors. Now I can't even begin to tell you how many people we had in our support server on the discord.py series complaining about errors and it just turns out it was indentation errors. Well, indentation errors are handled far, far better in Python 3.10. So if we have, we'll do something like this to start with. <clears throat> say you've got a function and you've forgotten to indent if true. You're, it will now say expected an indented block after function definition on line seven. So it now tells you on line seven, we have a function definition and it expected indentation block after that. I wonder, does it complain about inconsistent indentation? Oh, apparently that is just fine to do. Okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> uh, but if it's actually, because it, ah, because VS Code automatically converts it. I'm not sure if it does it if you have inconsistent spaces and tabs. I think it probably doesn't do the same thing. But if we do it like this as well, then it says expected an indented block after if statement on line eight. So you have this if statement on line eight, and oh, this is needs to be indented. This is needs to be well done, brain. Um, but yeah, the point is that the indentation errors, as long as as well as a lot of other uh, built-in errors like syntax errors, are just way nicer now. So if we actually look at the what's new document, we can see that there are a lot of 
new specialized syntax errors that have actually been put in place. So it can now tell you if you're missing a colon. Um, it can now tell you if you've forgotten some parentheses or brackets as we call them in the UK, but I'm just reading the thing here. <laughs> it can tell you if you're missing, um, it can tell you if you're missing commas. It can tell you if multiple exception types need to be bracketed. There we go, that's the correct way of doing it. It can tell you if you're missing stuff after a dictionary key. It can tell you if you're missing certain blocks. It can, you know, it, there's so much stuff it can tell. This is assignment operator, I think, I feel like that was already there, but I, I might be wrong about that. And uh, F strings, I'm pretty sure that was already there too. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this is where I got the stuff for the indentation errors. And there's also name errors as well down here. Um, so it, it can tell you if there's like a similar name that you actually meant to put in. That's actually a really nice one too. So that's all the stuff that I wanted to show you in terms of stuff that I've actually coded. I might actually zoom this in a bit for you. So we've talked about, you know, these three. We've also talked about this BPO. We've talked about PEP 618. We skipped out most of these. So we skipped 626 because it's just for debuggers. We skipped 613 and 612 because I don't really understand them. I don't think a lot of people use type aliases so much. So that's not really something I need, felt as though I need to talk about. And this, you know, important deprecations and stuff, I felt like I didn't need to mention either. And there's also all of these other, like, slight language changes. You can see why I'm not going through all of them, because, wow, there are a lot. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's no new modules, interestingly, but I did want to talk about some improved modules. So this argpass thing, I find particularly um, interesting. I've been using argpass a lot, because I'm building a command line utility at the moment. But it's saying, uh, misleading phrase, optional arguments was replaced with options in argpass help. Some tests might require adaptation, so I rely on exact output match. And this one is really interesting. I'm actually going to make an entirely separate video about the history of this problem. It's only going to be a really short one, maybe three or four minutes or so. There isn't a huge amount to it. But it is a very interesting just thing to look at and see kind of how this ended up happening. The data classes module actually got a, a, a good number of, uh, of changes. So you now have the slots in data classes. You can now do keyword only fields in data classes and you can actually specify individual arguments to be keyword only as well. The other one I wanted to talk about was idle and we'll probably leave this video here after I've talked about this. But idle has actually had a number of, of different changes. So you can see it says it has it's, it's added a shell sidebar and it's moved the primary prompt and the secondary prompts to that sidebar. Now what this allows you to do is it allows you to copy paste stuff from idle a lot easier. So if you're used to prototyping with idle, then it's just make it's just made prototyping so much easier. Uh, this only really affects Lin uh, sorry not Linux Windows users because Windows has idle pre-installed Linux and Mac OS does not. So you might as well just use the um, you might as well just use a terminal, especially since the terminal is a lot better on Linux than it is on Windows. But this just makes using the idle just that much nicer. But yeah, that's pretty much it. There are a lot of other changes as well. I'd recommend actually looking through this what's new in Python 3.10. It's always just really good whenever there's a new version to just look through it and see, you know, what's new, what's changed, because there are going to be some really small changes that affect you in big ways, like that zip strict, for example. And then there's another thing with glob. I use glob quite a lot, and that's adding kind of extra stuff to make using that easier. So that is all just really nice stuff that you might not know if you haven't been, uh, you know, keeping up with these documents. So I'd recommend, you know, every time there's a new alpha, beta, RC release, or maybe just the betas, actually, um, and the RCs, Every time there's a new release, just come back here and see what's new from the last time. Because there's some really cool stuff buried in here um, that some people might just not know about. If you have any questions about what you've seen, then don't be afraid to leave a comment in the comment section below. Or you can join the Discord server using the link in the description. But yeah, with that, I'd like to thank my amazing patrons on screen now. One pound a month and you can be on that screen too. And I'll see you next time where we talk about Hakari. So we're going back to Hakari for the next video. And I'm going to be showing you kind of just how to get stuff set up in kind of the little supplementary series that I'm going to get going before the actual proper one hits in either December or January. So I'll see you for that.